It is about quarter after the hour, so I'll start with the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dean Lotito, and I'm the chapter coordinator for the PKD New England chapter. I'll be your hospitality host for the session. You've joined Dallas 101. Before we get started, uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box, and I'll collect them during the presentation, and we'll address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session. We do ask that you keep your microphone muted throughout the entire session so that to ensure good audio quality for everyone involved. <laughs> I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for this session, Dr. Benjamin D. Cowley Jr., the Chief of Nephrology and Hypertension, OU Regents Professor, and John Gamble, Professor of, in Polycystic Kidney Disease at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Dr. Cowley, it's my pleasure to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Dean. And uh, thank you to all of you who are joining us. Um, I'm hoping that much of what I'm going to tell you is review. Um, obviously, many of you are already dealing with some degree of renal impairment. And I'm hoping that your care team has started to discuss some of these issues with you, because I think the more you know before you get there, the better off you're going to be able to deal with what's coming. Um, this is the obligatory disclaimer. The PKD Foundation uh, would like to emphasize that what we're doing is for educational purposes. We're certainly not making any specific recommendations for individual patients. Um, the people that invo inv involved in these presentations, including myself, have no financial uh, relationships to disclose, certainly not with respect to what I'm going to be discussing. And with that, we will proceed. Um, what I'd like to do over the next oh, 30 to 45 minutes is talk a little bit about what kidneys do, talk about the consequences of deterioration of kidney function, talk about when kidney failure reaches end stage, and we'll talk a little bit about why that may not be the greatest term in the world. We'll, we'll at least mention transplantation because I'm also a transplant physician and I truly believe that transplantation is the best way to treat chronic kidney disease. It is not a cure, but I think it is a more effective treatment than dialysis. Having said that, dialysis is frequently necessary. We'll talk about what dialysis does and what it, what it does not do. We'll talk about how dialysis works. We'll talk about different types of dialysis and how you may, might make a choice. And then we'll talk about how to stay healthy while you're on dialysis. So hopefully, as I said, this is review, but what do kidneys do? Well, obviously our kidneys produce urine. What's urine? It's water, it's electrolytes, things like sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphate, and acid, and it's waste products, toxins. In addition to producing urine, our kidneys either both produce hormones and they respond to hormones. They produce a hormone called erythropoietin, which promotes blood formation. They activate a form of vitamin D, which is important in maintenance of healthy bones. And our kidneys produce renin, which is a hormone that's important in blood pressure regulation. When kidney function deteriorates, you have a disruption in urine production water and, and salt, water and sodium begin to accumulate. That causes high blood pressure, which many of you probably already have. If it's severe enough, it can cause shortness of breath and it can cause swelling. We obviously try and avoid all three of those things. And we do that through a variety of ways. One, we ask you to restrict salt intake. Um, even if you're healthy, restricting salt intake is, is perfectly healthy to do. The amount of salt it's necessary to stay healthy is minuscule compared to what most Americans take in. That's frequently not enough. We give medicines called diuretics that encourage your kidneys to get rid of salt and water. And then as your blood pressure becomes more difficult to control, we may add medications to help control your blood pressure. Um, so as, as we were saying, um, water and salt accumulation causes high blood pressure, shortness of breath and swelling. We treat that with sodium restriction, diuretics, as well as blood pressure medication. Um, control of blood pressure is extremely important. And um, 
lack of blood pressure control, uncontrolled blood pressure will accelerate the deterioration of your kidney function. In addition, it will increase your risk of high blood pressure and strokes. So blood pressure control is extremely important. In addition, um, as kidney function deteriorates further, um, you have disruption in electrolyte regulation. Are you guys still seeing my screen, I hope? Dean? No, I'm not. Uh, You're not. All right, let me, well, let me try a different share here. What is that? I'm waiting. You got it? I don't see it. I don't I'm seeing a slide that says when kidney function deteriorates. Is that, that's what we need. Um, all right. I, why I don't see it. That's okay. Go ahead. Continue. Perfect. Um, as your kidney function deteriorates, not only do you tend to accumulate salt and water, you tend to accumulate other things such as potassium. Potassium, when it accumulates to high levels, can cause abnormal heart rhythms, which are potentially dangerous. We treat that by asking you to restrict dietary potassium. In addition, diuretics, which encourage salt and water excretion by your kidneys, will also tend, at least with certain diuretics, to cause potassium excretion in your urine. If that's insufficient, we will sometimes temporize by giving medications that will bind potassium in your intestines, such as caexalate, localma, and veltasa. These buy us time. They're probably not good long-term solutions, but they can buy us time um, and, and allow us to avoid either dialysis or transplant um, and help control potassium. And then other electrolytes become disrupted. Um, our kidneys are important in regulating or activating vitamin D, as I mentioned. Vitamin D deficiency causes lack of absorption of calcium from the intestines, so you become calcium deficient. That leads to abnormal bone metabolism. We'll sometimes give dietary potassium supplementation as well as vitamin D supplementation. As your kidney function deteriorates, your kidneys become impaired in their ability to excrete phosphorus or phosphate, same thing. That leads to abnormal bone metabolism. It can accelerate cardiovascular disease and it can cause itching. To treat that, we have you restrict dietary phosphate and we give you medicines to bind phosphorus in your food so that you don't absorb them called, called phosphate binders, something that everybody's pretty fond of not really. Um, and then finally, um, our kidneys become impaired the ability to get rid of acid. Acid accumulation has a variety of uh, detrimental effects, including abnormal bone metabolism. And we will frequently give you alkali, literally things like sodium bicarbonate, to neutralize acid and once again, limit the effects of acid accumulation. And then finally, as kidney function becomes disrupted and urine production is disrupted, you tend to accumulate waste products, toxins. There are a variety of toxins, many of which aren't very well characterized. They can cause a variety of things from benign to serious. They can cause bad breath, they cause itching. As they become more, more uh, uh, prevalent, as they accumulate to higher levels, they cause loss of appetite which leads to weight loss and malnutrition, which is obviously a bad thing. They can also really cause nausea and vomiting. If we, aren't, if we aren't paying attention and we don't intervene, they can cause inflammation of internal organs, such as uh, the heart, which causes pericarditis. They can cause intestinal bleeding. It can lead to disrupted brain function with di uh, difficulty concentrating and confusion. And then if it becomes very severe, you can have seizures. Now, obviously, we tend to intervene before these more serious consequences happen. But these are the serious consequences of waste product accumulation from kidney impairment. In addition, as your kidney function deteriorates, you have disrupted hormone production. You have erythropoietin deficiency. We obviously can give supplemental erythropoietin. Vitamin D is disrupted. And frequently, renin is produced in excessive, excess levels leading to more difficult blood pressure control. So 
as kidney function is deteriorating, we monitor a variety of things. And this is true across the entire continuum of kidney function from you know, minor kidney dysfunction all the way to end stage kidney disease. We monitor your volume status and your blood pressure. We monitor your nutritional status. We'll monitor blood chemistries that are associated with bone disease. We'll manage anemia caused by deficiency of erythropoietin and we will monitor waste product removal by your kidneys as well as after you start dialysis. All of these things are monitored before you begin dialysis and they're monitored after you begin dialysis. So what happens when kidneys reach end stage? And I, I, in some ways, I think end stage kidney disease, also known as end stage renal disease is a somewhat poor choice of words. And the reason why I say that Kidneys can still function, um, but really what's happening is your kidneys are no longer functioning well enough to keep you healthy. And so when kidneys reach what we think of as end stage, you need either a transplant or dialysis. And as I mentioned, I think transplant is really a better way to treat end stage kidney disease. It's not a cure but it's a better way of treating end-stage kidney disease. But, you know, not everybody can get a transplant as quickly as they would want. And sometimes transplants don't always work as long as we would want. Um, the one thing I would add is that even if you start dialysis, your remaining kidney function may be important in helping to maintain your volume status as well as to assist in waste product removal. So residual kidney function is something we actually do pay attention to. How do we ultimately determine when end stage kidney disease occurs? Well, quite simply, it's when things are no longer controllable. You either have uncontrollable fluid accumulation, you have uncontrollable potassium accumulation, you have uncontrollable acid accumulation, and you have dangerous toxic accumulation, what we call uremia. Now, we obviously want to avoid uremia. We don't want you to have a seizure before we start you on dialysis. So we monitor these things and try to intervene before serious consequences occur. Now, typically people begin to get into trouble or we begin to become seriously concerned about end stage kidney disease when kidney function reaches about 10 to 15% of normal. We don't, we don't wanna wait until then to have a plan. Um, it's, it's important to try and have a plan well before you reach end stage kidney disease, because there are things we can do to prepare, prepare you for dialysis if it's necessary. And if you're fortunate, you may receive a transplant before you need dialysis. The best way for that to happen is what happened for Dean, which is to receive a transplant from a living donor. Um, but whether it's a living donor or deceased donor, it's in your best interest to receive a transplant before you need dialysis. There are some things that dialysis does not do. And, and I want to emphasize this. Dialysis alone will keep you alive, but it will not keep you healthy. To stay healthy with end stage kidney disease requires either a kidney transplant and medications and changes in your diet, or it requires dialysis and medications and changes in your diet. Whether you get a transplant or whether you're on dialysis, you're gonna require medications as well as changes in your diet to stay healthy. You can stay healthy with end stage kidney disease, but it requires more than just transplant or dialysis. There's some things dialysis definitely does not do. It does not remove phosphate effectively. As I mentioned before, phosphate accumulation causes bone disease. It actually increases the risk of death so we restrict diet, we ask you to restrict dietary phosphate and take phosphate binders. In addition, we'll give you vitamin D and related drugs to try and control um, some of the effects of phosphate accumulation. Dialysis does not correct anemia. We give supplemental iron and we give supplemental erythropoietin to try and uh, avoid anemia. In fact, the one of the major advances in control in treatment of end stage kidney disease when was when the gene for erythropoietin was cloned and supplemental erythropoietin recombinant erythropoietin became available. And then finally, dialysis will control fluid accumulation, but it will there are limits. If if you 
gain fluid excessively, we may have trouble removing that excess fluid with dialysis. So we ask you to restrict dietary and fluid intake um, and uh, almost uniformly um, high blood pressure, hypertension will require medications in addition to dialysis. So what does dialysis actually do? Well, dialysis allows us to remove fluid, but as I mentioned, there are limitations. It allows us to remove chemicals in that fluid, electrolytes, salt, sodium, potassium, and acid, and it allows us to remove toxins. We strive to do that in a way that avoids dramatic shifts in electrolytes and fluids, and we strive to do it in a way that interferes with your life to the limited extent that we can, of, at least uh, to the extent that we can avoid it. How does dialysis work? All types of dialysis require some sort of access to the patient, and Walt will we'll talk a minute about how that varies between different types of dialysis. And then you need a membrane across which fluid and waste products are filtered, and I'll show you a picture here in just a minute. You require a dialysis solution, what we call dialysate, to collect fluid and waste products. And since that dialysate is going to be in contact with the patient, it requires sterile constituents, sterile water and sterile chemicals. And then dialysis requires regular monitoring of patient status. We monitor how effectively we're removing waste products. We monitor your electrolytes. We monitor blood pressure and volume status. We monitor your nutritional status, and then we monitor your well-being. We want you to feel well when you're on dialysis. Um, as I mentioned, dialysis requires a membrane across which waste products remove. It's what we call a semi-permeable membrane, shown here in yellow. This membrane has small holes in it, which allows small constituents like toxins, electrolytes, and water to move from the blood into the dialysis fluid, what we call a dialysate, but larger molecules such as cells like red blood cells and white cells and protein do not move across this semi-permeable membrane. That's why we call it semi-permeable. It only allows small constituents into the dialysate, which we then discard. There are different types of dialysis. Um, you can think of different types of dialysis in a couple of ways. One, where do you do it? Some people dialyze at home. Some people dialyze in a center or a dialysis clinic. And then you can think about different types of dialysis, what we call modalities. Hemodialysis or what some people would call blood dialysis and then peritoneal dialysis. And we're gonna talk about both. With hemodialysis, blood is removed from the patient, pumped through a dialyzer, an artificial kidney, and then returned to the patient. Fluid, electrolytes, and toxins are removed by the dialyzer. And in this case, the semi-permeable membrane is artificial and manufactured. This is a picture of a typical artificial kidney, what we call a dialyzer. The blood goes through the center and the dialysate goes in an opposite direction. If you cut this dialyzer in cross section, there are thousands, this is, this is amplified to make it, uh, or magnified to make it visible. There are thousands of little hollow fibers. Inside the hollow fibers, blood runs, and then outside the hollow fibers, dialysis runs surrounding these hollow fibers. And it's these hollow fibers that have the semi permeable membrane so that waste products and fluid move from the blood into the dialysis space and are discarded. A typical, with, with typical hemodialysis, we've got about 150 to 200 milliliters of blood out of the body at any one time. Most people have about five liters or five quarts of blood in their bloodstream, and you've got 40 plus quarts or 40 liters of fluid in your system. Waste products accumulate in all 40 quarts, and if we've only, if we've only got one cup of blood out of your body, and we want to cleanse 40 quarts of fluid, we got to run a lot of a lot of cups of blood through the dialyzer. We typically run the blood at three to 500 milliliters a minute, at one to two cups per minute. Thus, access to your blood bloodstream becomes critically important. 
in emergent situations, if we have to dialyze someone emergently, we can literally put a temporary catheter either in the neck or in the groin. Um, it's got two sides to it. One side, we withdraw the dirty blood. The other side, we return the clean blood. This can be used immediately, but it's very temporary. It's not the kind of thing you can leave the hospital with, and it carries a significant risk of infection. Another type of catheter, what we call the tunnel tough catheter, I would still call temporary, although it can, it, it can be used outside the hospital. With a tunnel cuff catheter, the catheter enters the skin, tunnels in the fatty tissue underneath the skin, and then enters a vein in the neck. Between where it enters the skin and where it enters the vein, there's a fiber cuff. Scar tissue grows into that cuff to anchor it so it won't fall out and, forget, and provide a barrier against infection. But that barrier is not perfect. Even a tunnel cuff catheter has a, a significant risk of infection and they tend to clot and they tend just not to work well. It's not a good long-term solution. Although unfortunately some people do use tunnel cuff catheters for an extended period of time. This is the type of catheter you could use, lose, use leave the hospital with, but it's not a, a good long-term solution. Somewhat better long-term solution is to use an artificial blood vessel, what we call a graft. With a, with a graft, what we're doing is we're connecting artery to a vein with an artificial blood vessel. This, once this is placed, we like to leave it in place for a week or two for, it to, for the, the uh, incisions to heal and to allow this to sort of settle in. But when it's ready to use within you know, a week or two or three, we put one needle in to withdraw the dirty blood, a second needle to return the clean blood, only when you're on dialysis. In between dialysis, there's nothing there but skin. A graft is a good way of, uh, a better way of doing dialysis than a tunnel, tunnel catheter, but they have a finite lifetime. These don't last, you know, 10 to 15 years. They'll last three or four years, you know, if you're lucky. The best thing to have is an arterial venous fistula. And with an arterial venous fistula, what the surgeons do is they correct a, connect an artery directly to the vein, bypassing the capillaries. And in this situation, the pressure in the artery is directly transmitted to the vein. The vein gets larger, the wall of the vein gets thicker. And once that's mature, once again, we put one needle in to withdraw the dirty blood, a second needle to uh, return the clean blood only when you're on dialysis. Um, in between dialysis sessions, there's only skin. I knew a young man who used the same fistula for 26 years. He had the type of kidney disease that actually recurred in transplants. He had a recurrence of his disease in his transplant. He did not have PKD. PKD does not recur in transplants, by the way. Um, but he had recurrent disease and lost his transplant. So he stayed on dialysis for 26 years using the same fistula. This is basically the Tesla of dialysis, hemodialysis access. If, if you can get a good fistula, it will be your lifeline. And the risk of infection with either a fistula or a graft is significantly less than with a tunnel catheter. This is what it looks like. This is a standard dialysis machine. This is a dialyzer. The red, the red, the red uh, tubing you see, one is to, to remove blood from the patient. The other is returning the clean blood to the patient. And basically you sit and relax and either read the newspaper or watch television or simply snooze. In, set, in center dialysis, when you go to a dialysis clinic, typically you'll do dialysis three times a week, either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, or Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, typically for three to four hours at a session. It re results in fairly rapid removal of fluid and waste products and rapid correction of electrolytes. One thing you need to think about in between dialysis sessions, you've got two and over a weekend, three days to gain salt and fluid. We've got three to four hours to take it off. One of the things that makes people feel bad is if they gain too much fluid and it becomes difficult to remove it. There are certain dialysis clinics that will do dialysis at night 
once again, typically three hours uh, or three times a week, typically eight hours per night while you sleep in the session, at least a more gradual removal of fluid and waste product and gradual correction of electrolytes. Some people prefer this. It's not available in every dialysis clinic or every town, but it is an option for some patients. Alternatively, you can do hemodialysis at home. And studies have looked at comparing home dialysis, including home hemodialysis to in-center hemodialysis. Patient, patients that dialyze at home typically have better nutrition. They end up in the hospital less frequently. They have improved survival. They're less more independent. They tend to be more active and they typically have a better sense of well-being. To some extent, there's probably a selection bias, meaning people who dialyze at home tend to be a little bit more stable and they tend to be more engaged in their own care. And so that's probably part of the reason why people who dialyze at home tend to do somewhat better. In the past, we did use standard uh, dialysis machines for people to dialyze at home. There are probably a few programs that still do that. For that to happen, you're using a regular dialysis machine in a home and you have to have a special water purification system in your home. One of the things that's necessary to do hemodialysis is you need very pure water. It not only needs to be sterile or at least very clean, you can't have any other constituents in it or they'll get into the patient and make the patient sick. There are newer home hemodialysis systems that include pre-prepared hemodialysis solutions or a unique system that will prepare dialysis in the home and a, and a newer hemodialysis machine. Regardless of whether you're doing traditional home hemodialysis or using this new system, you typically need to have a trained partner because one of the side effects of dialysis is you can develop low blood pressure and you need someone to give you fluid. If your blood pressure gets low, you may not be able to give yourself some saline. With, with some of these newer hemodialysis systems, people will do more frequent dialysis. They'll do dialysis four and five times a week with shorter sessions. Not all programs actually require a partner. In addition, there are some programs that will allow people to dialyze at night at home. Uh, and once again, that's a more gradual type of dialysis and not all programs require a trained partner for that. This is a, this, these are some pictures of one of these newer home hemodialysis machines. And as I say, it, it, it include, the, these uh, come with pre-prepared, either a pre-prepared uh, sterile dialysis solution or a uh, unique dial uh, uh, system. This black box here you see underneath the machine, that's actually preparing dialysate. Once again, if you're doing it short and frequently, you may not require a partner, and, and if you do it at night, you may not require a partner. Complications of hemodialysis include cramping if we have to take off too much fluid. That can also cause your blood pressure to fall. People sometimes develop headaches. They have nausea and vomiting. They feel washed out. They get abnormal heart rhythms and they get infections. Many of these side effects are a function of how much fluid you gain or whether you're not careful with your diet. And so many of the complications are limited if the patient's careful about their diet and their fluid accumulation. The other major type of dialysis is what we call peritoneal dialysis. And the reason why we call it peritoneal dialysis is there is an empty cavity in your abdomen called the peritoneal cavity. It's lined by a peritoneal membrane. And this peritoneal membrane acts as the semi-permeable membrane that we need to do dialysis. Once again, it allows us to remove excess fluid, electrolytes and toxins, and it's done at home. There's no need for a helper. Um, and what you do is you exchange fluid. You put clean fluid in your abdomen for a period of time, waste products and excess fluid move into your abdominal cavity. You throw away the dirty fluid and then you do it all over again. These exchanges can be done either manually or by an automated machine at night. This is a picture um, from the side of your peritoneal cavity. Your abdominal organs are in gray and this dark area is the peritoneal cavity. It's typically relatively empty. There's some lubricant to allow your intestines to wiggle around while they're digesting your food, 
but it is a potential space. To do peritoneal dialysis, we have the surgeons put a catheter. This picture doesn't show it quite so well, but what happens is that catheter enters the skin, tunnels in the fatty tissue under the skin, and then it enters the abdominal cavity. Between where it enters the skin and where it enters the abdominal cavity, there's a cuff. Scar tissue grows into that cuff to anchor it so it doesn't fall out and to provide a barrier against infection. This shows the system. This is a drain line where you drain the, the dirty fluid. Once you've drained the dirty fluid, you clamp this line, you open this up, and you put clean flow in it, fluid in, and then you disconnect. I'll show a picture of that here in, in just a moment. When you do, do peritoneal dialysis, there are self, several things that have to be determined. One, how much do you put into your abdominal cavity? Typically, it's between two and three quarts per exchange. We'll need to determine how many exchanges per day. That's typically a function of how effectively we're removing waste products. And once again, we monitor that. And then we'll talk about the, the doctor will typically determine the type of dialysis, although frankly, very few people do manual exchanges anymore. This is how peritoneal dialysis first started. It was all manual. But as, as automated machines became available, the vast majority of patients do automated dialysis at night. The patient and the doctor to de together determine the type of dialysis solution that's used. And what I mean by that, the way we withdraw fluid from the patient into the abdominal cavity is by varying the amount of sugar, varying the amount of glucose that's in the peritoneal dialysate fluid. That, glu that glucose, that sugar, sucks fluid from the patient into the abdominal cavity, and then you throw it away. By having different concentrations of glucose, you can vary the amount of fluid that's removed. In addition, there's a newer molecule called icodextrin, which is even more effective at fluid removal. That's used in selected circumstances that you and the physician will determine. This is a picture of someone doing what's called chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. Basically, the manual exchange is done by the patient. And this is how, this is how peritoneal dialysis started. Basically, in this, the patient always is carrying fluid. There's fluid in the abdominal cavity, except when the patient's doing an exchange. In between exchanges, the catheter is hooked to nothing. It's just basically taped up to your abdomen. When it's time to do an exchange, you wash your hands, you put on a mask, you connect yourself to a system that has an empty bag and a full bag. You, you open a clamp, the fluid in your abdomen fills this empty bag. Once the empty bag is full, you clamp the line going to the, to the drain bag, and then you open a clamp where this clean dialysis fluid enters your abdomen. This is dirty fluid, this is clean fluid. So what you're doing is you're draining dirty fluid and replacing it with clean fluid. And you typically do that four to five times a day. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do a manual exchange. I've had a few patients do this because they thought it fit their lifestyle better, but it's unusual that patients do uh, CAPD anymore. Most people will use an automated machine that cycles fluid in and out of their abdomen while they're sleeping. Basically, you hook yourself up to a machine at night and the machines, you know, puts a couple liters of fluid in your abdomen for two to three hours, automatically drains it, and then does it all over again. Now, not all patients can achieve adequate toxin and fluid removal with an automated cycler. We'll sometimes use hybrids. Sometimes we'll use, have a patient use a cycler at night, and then we'll have them carry fluid during the day and maybe even do a manual exchange in the middle of the day. So there are sort of variations in between automated dialysis as well as a manual exchange or CAPD. Complications of peritoneal dialysis. One, sometimes the, the, the peritoneal membrane or the peritoneal cavity simply is inadequate for removing toxins. Sometimes it doesn't adequately provide adequate fluid removal. And because of this peritoneal dialysis may not remove, may not work for all patients. We monitor how effectively we're removing waste products, just like we do with hemodialysis. And we obviously monitor how effectively we're removing fluid. 
One of the other complications of peritoneal dialysis is infections. You know, you're putting fluid into an, into the abdominal cavity, and so there's a, it's the fluid in the abdominal cavity is warm, it's wet, and it's full of sugar. Those are ideal ideal ways to grow bacteria and and fungi, yeast, and so you have to be very careful to try and avoid contaminating yourself. And then finally, malnutrition is a complication of peritoneal dialysis. Every time you throw away dirty fluid, you're throwing away about an egg's worth of protein. There's, in the absence of peritoneal dialysis with a normal abdominal cavity, there's fluid trafficking through the abdomen and it's very rich in protein. It basically goes into the abdomen and goes right back out, typically through the lymphatics. When you put a peritoneal dialysis catheter into the abdomen and put fluid in there, you're interrupting that traffic. So every time you throw, every time you drain and throw away peritoneal dialysis fluid, you're throwing away about an egg's worth of protein. And so you need to be able to eat um, effectively, eat, eat protein to try and avoid malnutrition. This is your event and staff checking in with 10 minutes remaining in your session. We are just about done. That's perfect timing. Um, people ask about the artificial kidney and I, I, we don't have time to talk about this in detail. What I would say is that there are a couple of types of artificial kidneys that people are trying to develop. They are still very experimental. There's something called the wearable artificial kidney, um, which is still very experimental. There was a study published back in 2016 where they screened over 400 patients. They were hoping to enroll 10 patients. They ultimately only enrolled seven. Only five of them completed 24 hours with the wearable artificial kidney, but it did basically prove that you could do this. This is what it looks like. It's you know basically a fancy fanny pack with a dialyzer and a, a whole lot of other you know pieces of equipment hooked to a belt. But you know it's 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 you know proof of concept that you can miniaturize some of these things and potentially have it go with the patient. So the other holy grail is what would be called the bioartificial kidney, um, which is a hybrid between um, actually human cells, which are shown here, which would line this particular hollow, this, this canister. Um, and you have blood going through here, you filter fluid, and then that filtered fluid goes through this, this second cartridge, which processes the fluid using real human cells. And it's basically, the, the goal is design really sort of an artificial kidney using human constituents. Um, and ultimately the idea is to develop one that can be implanted into a patient, blood going through the artificial kidney, back clean blood going back into the patient, and then process fluid going to the bladder. This is really conceptual at this point, although they, the, the people that are trying to develop this did recently within the past year or two publish uh, um, a study in which they implanted something like this with human cells into a, uh, a non-human uh, um, animal. Basically, they were able to implant human cells into a non-human animal. The cells are basically protected from the environment, so you can't, the cells are not attacked by uh, the recipient, either whether it would be human or a non-human animal. So this remains something very experimental, but people always ask about it. It is not anywhere close to being a replacement for dialysis, and it's not anywhere close to being a replacement for a transplant. How do you choose what type of dialysis you do? Some of it's a lifestyle issue. What fits your lifestyle better? Some of it may have proximity to the closest dialysis center, depending on whether you live in urban or a rural area. If you're gonna do home dialysis, you may need a partner. Limitations of the peritoneal cavity may limit your ability to do peritoneal dialysis. If you've had multiple abdominal surgeries, that may prevent you from doing peritoneal dialysis. In addition, you if you're doing hemodialysis, you have to be able to gain reliable access to the bloodstream. 
Typically, PKD patients are reasonable candidates for any either one of these types of dialysis, but this typically needs to be individualized with discussions between the patient and the physician. One of the things that we frequently forget to tell people, because we take it for granted, is that people switch between different types of dialysis all the time. If you're doing peritoneal dialysis and you develop a severe infection, we may have to remove the peritoneal dialysis catheter and you may have to switch to hemodialysis for a period of time. Alternatively, if you're doing hemodialysis and you have difficulty maintaining vascular access, you may switch to peritoneal dialysis for a period of time. People go back and forth between different dialysis modalities all the time. So staying healthy with end-stage kidney disease. Dialysis alone will keep you alive, but it will not keep you healthy. To stay healthy with end-stage kidney disease requires either a kidney transplant and medications and changes in your diet or dialysis and medications and changes in your diet. Um, regardless of whether you have a transplant or whether you have, or the, whether you're doing dialysis, you are at increased risk for vascular, especially cardiovascular disease. So it's important to try and control sodium and phosphate. It's important to control high blood pressure. It's important to control lipids, including cholesterol and triglycerides. It's important to exercise to the extent that you are able. And for God's sakes, don't smoke. Anyway, I appreciate your time and attention. Um, and I will certainly be happy to answer any questions which any of you might have. Once again, thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Colley. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, again, as a reminder, please keep your microphones muted and type the questions to the chat, chat box. So a couple of questions came in. Uh, what GFR should you start planning for dialysis or transplant? That's one question. Um, I think that depends a little bit upon how rapidly your kidney function is deteriorating. I think planning for dialysis, or for, planning for transplant or dialysis is probably a good thing to at least begin doing once your GFR gets down below 30. Um, because it doesn't happen immediately. What, if, if you're going to receive a transplant, there's an evaluation process you need to go through. Even if you have a living donor, there's an evaluation process they need to go through. Technically, if you're going to, if you're having to wait for a deceased donor transplant, you won't become eligible for a deceased donor transplant until your GFR is less than 20. Um, but there's no reason to wait until it's less than 20 to begin preparing for a transplant. Once again, as I mentioned, um, if you're going to do dialysis, we need to either uh, place vascular access or place a peritoneal dialysis catheter. Um, if a fistula sometimes takes months to mature, and it doesn't always work the first time. So, but, you know, having a fistula beforehand um, or well before you need it is a good idea, especially because a fistula can last you many years. I wouldn't place a graft long before you need it because they have a finite lifetime. A peritoneal dialysis catheter probably doesn't need to be placed more than a, you know, a few weeks, you know, or maybe a few months before you begin dialysis. But you need to begin thinking about it once your GFR gets down below 25 to 30. So, guys, okay, a good follow up here. Who does this monitoring? Your nephrologist. Uh, this question is you should be doing all this work with your nephrologist, right? That's correct. The, the person who's going to monitor you for, and you should be beginning to have discussions with your nephrologist about, you know, when should we start talking about or transplant? When should we start talking about dialysis? Your nephrologist will be able to give you that type of information. Someone asked if they're going through a, a, a trans, planning on a transplant, but they need dialysis for a short period of time, would you recommend a chest catheter or fistula in that case? That's, if you're really convinced, I mean, and the problem is you can never be certain that you're gonna get a transplant. If you're, if you're very convinced that you're gonna get a transplant fairly quickly, a tunnel dialysis catheter is not the end of the world. The problem is unanticipated things can happen. You know, if you've got, if you think you have a living donor, that living donor may not be a suitable candidate. And for sure, if you're waiting for a deceased donor kidney, there's never any certainty. So 
if if you're absolutely certain that your living donor is not going to you know have a problem a tunnel catheter is not the end of the world a fistula is always a better way of doing dialysis especially if it's going to be for any extended period of time but a fistula has to be done well ahead of time the advantage of a tunnel dialysis catheter once we place it we can use it immediately that's all the questions we seem to have now. Uh, it's the end of the hour. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Cowley, and uh, thank everyone for joining, and, and please enjoy the rest of the conference.